Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. I'm Suzanne Miller, I'm a Senior Research Fellow in Simon Johnson's lab and I'm currently funded by the LAM Foundation um, and I'm going to talk to you about LAM research in Nottingham. So firstly I want to introduce you to the research team and then I'll go on to show you a few pictures of the new building that we've moved into, the Biodiscovery Institute. And then for any new patients out there, I'm going to give a brief introduction to LAM. I'm going to go through uh, some of the publications that we've had published this year. Firstly, the evolution of the LAM lung. So that's where we look at the pathology of the LAM lung um, from diagnosis right the way through to uh, end stage disease. And the second paper is uh, metabolomics in LAM. And that's where we've looked to, in patients' blood, at the met metabolites um, in the blood. And finally, I'll give a summary of the findings. So Simon's the head of the LAM research team. And in the lab, we've got myself. I uh, currently work on cathepsin K, which is a protease that we think might be uh, causing the lung cysts in LAM. Then we've also got Dr. Debbie Clements. Uh, she's going to be talking about um, her work that she's been doing in the lab. Um, in the next talk. And then we've got Roya, and Roya is currently funded by the Medical Research Council. She was previously funded by Tuberous Sclerosis Alliance, and uh, she's been working on mast cells in LAM, and mast cells are a type of immune cell. Other people um, that are working in LAM, um, you might know Jan Johnson. Um, she's been working behind the scenes on all the clinical data, um, so she um, curates um, lots of clinical data and she also performs some of the analyses for the papers, uh, especially the one that Simon's going to be talking about today. And we've got a brand new technician called Zoe Thompson. So the two papers that I'm going to talk about today, um, Dr Ian Stewart, he performed lots of the analysis and the statistics for that paper, the pathology paper, and we also um, have been collaborating with um, Dr Leonardo Bertolo. He's at the University of Cambridge and uh, he's done the data analysis for the metabolite work for the paper Metabolomics in Lab. So here's a little tour of the Biodiscovery Institute. Um, it's a hundred million pound building and it's a world leading hub of research excellence. It's actually joined onto two other buildings and um, All together, those buildings house around about a thousand academics, researchers, clinicians and also support staff. And we've all got a joint mission and that's through chemical, biological discovery and engineering. We hope to diagnose, treat and cure disease and provide security for a uh, better quality of life. And you can see the institute in the bottom left hand picture. For any new patients out there, I just wanted to introduce LAM. Um, the right hand top picture um, shows someone with um, healthy lungs and then in picture B, um, this is where the lungs have lung cysts in um, and also with LAM you can have pneumothorax. And the bottom uh, right hand corner shows a CT scan um, from someone with LAM uh, and you can see the small um, black holes and that's where the cysts within the lungs. So LAM is a rare multi-system disease and it's characterised by lung cysts, lymphatic abnormalities and in 60% of cases um, these kidney lesions known as angiomyolipomas. There's over 200 females in the UK with LAM. First symptoms can include collapsed lung and also breathlessness. Most LAM has an unknown cause, so it's sporadic, but in 30% of cases, uh, patients have tuberous sclerosis. Disease progression is highly variable in LAM, um, and whereas some patients have quite a stable disease, others could have quite a progressive um, disease. So in LAM, we have these LAM cells within the lung. We don't know where they're from, but we know that they have mutation of the TSC genes. And these genes usually regulate the activity of this mTOR signaling pathway in the cells. And usually mTOR would regulate how the cells grow, how they proliferate, um, how they move around and how they survive. Um, but if mTOR is not regulated, then it's always active and the, the cells can grow um, uncontrollably. 
There's a drug we're currently using in the clinic um, called rapamycin, also known as sirolimus, and this inhibits the mTOR pathway. But it isn't a cure. It can stabilise the lung function decline and the growth of the kidney lesions, AMLs. And there is a serum biomarker in the labs, and this is called VEGFD, and it's usually over 800 picograms per mil in patients with LAM. So we've got new insight into LAM now, um, but how we used to think about LAM was in the LAM you, know, you can get these lung cysts and around these cysts um, you'll find these LAM nodules, so these are clusters of LAM cells. And in the LAM cells we know that both functional copies of the TSC gene is lost, so there's uncontrolled growth of these LAM cells. But actually now we know that these LAM nodules don't just contain LAM cells, they contain other cell types that we should be interested in. So in 2015, Debbie released a paper where she found actually um, that there were fibroblasts within these LAM nodules as well as the LAM cells. And you can see in the right hand pictures, the middle picture, the brown staining is um, positive for PNL2 and PNL2 is a LAM cell marker. And then in the bottom right hand picture, um, some cells have stained for a fibroblast marker known as FSP. So actually there's other cells in the LAM nodules that we should be interested in um, because they don't just contain LAM cells. So I wanted to talk to you about um, some of the publications that we've had this year. Firstly in February um, we released an evolution of lung pathology in LAM paper and that was published in the Journal of Pathology Clinical Research and I'm going to talk to you today about that one. In March Debbie had her paper accepted and um, she's going to talk to you about that in her talk. And in May uh, we had another paper accepted and this is where we've looked at in the blood of LAM patients, we've looked at their metabolites and we've associated some metabolites with um, clinical features in LAM. And this was published in a, a quite a high impact journal called Thorax. And we've also got other papers in the pipeline. So Simon's going to talk to you about um, the machine learning paper. And Roy has also got a paper that she's working on um, about the mast cells in LAM and how they might be a potential therapeutic target. So firstly I'm going to talk about the first paper that we had published, um, the evolution of lung pathology in LAM. And this is where we've looked under the microscope of lots of different LAM samples um, from diagnosis all the way through to progression and we've found some associations with disease course and treatment response. So in this paper we've used immunohistochemical markers um, to look for proteins that we're interested in in lung biopsies, so at the start of the disease and also from um, explant samples um, right at the end stage disease um, from lung transplants. And we've linked all this staining to clinical information and we've used this to understand how LAM nodule cell populations can change with disease progression. So we collected 32 lamb lung tissue samples, um, 26 are at the start of the disease and 6 are explants from end stage disease. And I can show you a picture of 6 of the blocks that we collected. And what you can do, you can get a piece of lung from surgery and formally fix it and then you can um, embed it in wax and then it looks like these 6 blocks here. And what you can do is you can cut a tiny slither, so it's a 4 micron slither, um, through the block and you can put this on a glass slide and then you can stain it for whatever um, proteins you're interested in. Um, so you do that using immunohistochemistry and if it's positive, if the cells are positive then you get a brown stain come up. Um, so we use lots of different immunohistochemical markers um, which are named 1 to 10. We looked at cell nuclei in the cytoplasm and these are the pinky purple stains that you'll see. We looked at lamb cells using a marker called PNL2. We looked at smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, um, a protease, which is an enzyme that we think might be involved in lamb called cathepsin K. We looked at mast cells in the lung and we've looked for cells which are mTOR active. We looked at cell proliferation and we've also looked at lymphatic endothelial cells in the lamb using markers VEGFD and polyplanin. And then we scored all this immunohistochemistry, and I'll show you how we did that in the next slide. And we were able to compare how the lamb nodules in the lungs, uh, the staining, and we can 
paired that with patient clinical features and also prospective lung function loss and found associations. So this is the first figure of the paper. So Debbie and I, we performed all the immunohistochemistry for all those stains and we identified five different areas, five different nodules within each of those sections and we were interested in the cells within the nodule so we selected a region of interest and actually we had all of the sections made digital so they were nano zoomed using a special system in pathology so that we could see the pictures on the computer and analyse them. So we selected these squares within the nodules and here's an example using the whole um, panel that we're interested in and actually we got results from 147 nodules, 147 in total from the whole cohort and after quality control measures we got 1,319 images so it's a lot of images and it was great because we could give those to Ian and he analysed the data um, for all these images using a programme called Image J. And this is where you can see the panel C. It deconvolutes the image so it separates the brown staining, which is positive staining. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner the immunopositive area and it gives a score for this. And what we've done is we've used those scores, those numbers, that we identified for each of the stains and we've associated that with clinical features. And here is the first result. So we actually found that the more PNL2 positive cells, the more LAM cells uh, you had in the lung, uh, there was a better lung function. And we also found that the more cathepsin K that was immunopositive or reactive within the lungs, patients had a worse lung function. And we also looked at another lung function measure, DLCO, and that's um, to do with gas exchange in the lung, gas transfer, so how much oxygen is in your blood from the lungs. And we found that more PNL2 reactivity um, was associated with better DLCO, and more cathepsin K reactivity uh, was actually associated with a worse DLCO. And lastly, we found that more cathepsin K um, within the cells of the lamb lung, there was more found at the end stage, um, so increased disease duration, and we actually found less PNL2 reactivity as the disease progresses. So that means that you've got PNL2 positive cells more at the start of the disease and less at the end of the disease. So basically disease progression is associated with increasing cathepsin K and falling lamp cell marker, so PNL2, uh, within the nodules. Another result that we got was where we looked at mTOR activity using the immunomarker um, phospho S6 kinase and we found that there was a better response to rapamycin the higher the positive brown staining for this phospho S6 kinase. So the poor responders had low phospho S6 kinase, brown positivity, whereas those that responded well to rapamycin, they had higher levels of positive brown staining for phospho S6. So after looking at hundreds of sections of lamb lung, we've actually um, can propose a new evolution of lamb through the pathology. So actually, if you look at number one, at the start of the disease, there's lots of lamb cells amongst the alveoli, well, there's a few, and actually in number two, you can see these three pictures. As the lamb progresses, you get more lamb cells, and actually the lamb cells attract different cells through a term called chemotaxis, and the nodule gets bigger, and they actually attract fibroblasts, and they also attract mast cells. And then if we go up to the top right-hand corner, number three, then this small nodule grows bigger with all the different cell types in there, into a mature nodule and the nodule can get epithelial cell hyperplasia so that's where epithelial cells can go around the nodules and also you can get lymphatic clefts in the cyst walls and then on to number four so at the end stage actually you've got very few um, PNL2 positive lamb cells and actually you've got a lot more fibroblasts within the end stage lung and you can see that using the FSP marker 
uh, which is a marker of fibroblasts. So at the start of the disease, there's lamb cells, and at the end of the disease, they are overtaken by lots of other cells. And this is a picture actually that Naomi Johnson, who is Simon and Jan's daughter, she's very good with art, she's very talented, and she drew this picture for the paper. And she found, if you have a look in A, that the lamb cells are within the alveolar walls in A, and then in B, there's more cells within that area, um, including fibroblasts, lymphatic endothelial cells, and also mast cells. And then in C, you can see a nodule has formed as all, of all these different cell types, and you can see the lymphatic cleft with the blue cells. And then actually in D, there's lots of extracellular matrix that isn't normally there within the lung, and the cells within the lungs have got quite a lot of disorder to the structure. So in summary, lamb nodules evolve with disease progression, lamb cells become outnumbered by fibroblasts, increasing cathepsin K expression is associated with a more severe disease and lung function loss. Markers of mTOR activation predict the response to rapamycin. And this actually suggests that in more advanced lamb, it may be less sensitive to mTOR inhibition and actually treatment specifically targeted towards LAM associated fibroblasts may have roles as well as mTOR inhibition. And then I'm going to go on to the second paper, metabolomics in LAM. So firstly uh, we need to understand what metabolomics is. So metabolism is where you have a conversion of food or fuel um, which is going to the cells because um, they need energy to run these cellular processes which includes growth, proliferation um, to maintain structure and respond to the environment. And what are metabolites? So metabolites are actually intermediates or products of metabolism so it's where these chemical reactions happen and you get different products um, to get energy for the cell. And metabolomics, um, that's just the large scale study of all these small molecules um, known as metabolites. So this is the second paper, uh, Metabolomics in LAM, which was published in Thorax. And we're interested in metabolites because mTOR signaling is aberrant in LAM. And a major determinant of mTOR signaling is lipid and nucleotide synthesis. And so we thought, is the serum metabolome altered in LAM? And is it related to disease severity and disease activity? So the methods we used, we collected blood from 79 individuals with LAM. 29 were on rapamycin and 43 were control samples and um, we collected the serum uh, from the blood so you can see in the right hand corner the blood tube with the yellow top this blood has been spun in a centrifuge and the serum has come to the top the yellow serum and this is where the metabolites are that we're interested in and so what you can do you can collect lots of serums from lots of lamp patients and put it on a mass spectrometry machine which is the grey machine in the bottom left hand corner and you can look at what metabolites are in the serum and you can see an example of what you would see that the machine gives off so it gives peaks where there's particular metabolites in the serum and you can link this to the patient's clinical information and you can identify clinically relevant biomarkers. So after all the analysis that Leonardo did, we could actually see that there was 1,326 serum metabolites that were identified in the samples. And the majority were lipids, there were also amino acids, peptides, nucleotides, and carbohydrates. And this is figure one from the paper, which means something to scientists, but it's uh, quite hard to decipher. <laughs> so we looked at metabolites associated with LAM, with tuberous sclerosis and also with rapamycin treatment. And unfortunately, we didn't find any metabolites that were um, significantly different between those with LAM and the control women. And then we looked at just 
those with lamb that had tuberous sclerosis and we looked if uh, rapamycin treatment versus those um, that were untreated if there was any significant metabolites and we didn't find any and we also looked in those with sporadic lamb and um, those untreated and on rapamycin and we didn't find anything and then we looked at those with TSC lamb compared to sporadic lamb and we found 10 different metabolites between those groups. And then we looked at the lung function data we had for the patients to see if there was significantly different metabolites that were associated with lung function. And we grouped the lung function measurements for the patients into tertiles, so three different groups. And we actually found 11 metabolites that were different between those groups. So here's a volcano plot um, of the data and the blue dots are the 11 different metabolites that were significantly different and those metabolites were in um, classes including sphingolipids, fatty acids and phospholipids. And then we looked at metabolite associations with disease burden and disease activity and when we looked at disease burden we used a scoring system so the burden was based on how bad the lung function was in the patients, how good or bad the DLCO measurement was, and also the rate of decline in FEV1. And also if the patient had lymphatic involvement, um, that added to the burden score, and also the presence of AML. And we actually found from patients with good lung function, with no lymphatic involvement, and with no AMLs versus those patients with poor lung function or with lymphatic involvement or with presence of AML or all of those things, we found that the highest disease burden was associated with abnormalities in fatty acids, phospholipids and lysolipid metabolites. And that's shown in this volcano plot with the red dots. And metabolites actually have very long names, so I'm not going to name them all. And then we looked at the metabolites that were associated with rate of lung function decline. And again, we grouped the lung function decline into three different groups. And we actually found 22 different metabolites that were of interest. So almost all were lipid based, including fatty acids and sphingolipids. And you can see this in this uh, volcano plot by the green, red and blue dots. So in conclusion, sphingolipid, fatty acid and phospholipid metabolites are associated with disease severity, disease activity and in those with TSC LAM, treatment with rapamycin. And also lipid biomarkers are clinically relevant and they may have potential to be therapeutic targets for LAM in the future. So I'd like to thank Simon, Debbie and Roya. I'd like to thank Ian for the analysis of the pathology work. I'd like to thank Dr Ershad Sumru, um, who is a consultant histopathologist who looked at all the pathology for us. And also Leonardo Batolo, who performed the metabolomics analysis. And I'd also like to thank everyone at Respiratory Medicine at the University of Not Nottingham. Um, I'd like to thank Lab Foundation, who uh, support my work. Um, Lamb Action um, supports Debbie and they've also supported Roya and I'd like to thank the Nottingham Molecular Pathology Node who helped with some of the pathology work and I'd also like to thank the NIHR Rare Disease Translational Research Collaboration who funded some of the work. Thank you for listening. Um, now, we would normally have asked Suzanne to come and take questions on that for us, but uh, since she's got a young baby in the house and felt that the, the needs of her child came first, um, we actually asked Debbie if she would answer some questions um, because she also worked on the research. So it's great to be able to welcome Dr. Debbie Clements. Uh, can you hear us okay? All, all well? I can. Hi, Hi everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so I may have a question. I'm not sure. We'll see if anything else comes up on um, Slido. But uh, I was just uh, interested to hear in that first paper that land cells are present in the early stages of the disease, but they're replaced by uh, fibroblasts and conception K as the disease progresses. So I just wondered, are the treatment options that arise from that, are the things that we can do because we know that that happens? We think that mast cells accumulate 
and that they can cause fibroblasts to grow. So we're targeting things that affect fibroblast proliferation and fibroblast cathepsin K and fibroblast collagen deposition. And also it was, it was good to note that there, there's a better response to rapamycin with higher phospho S6 kinase. So again, does that, does that lead you down a, a kind of treatment path? Actually, in some ways, this is a nice validation of the technique because actually we know that phosphorylated S6 kinase is downstream of mTOR. Um, and so the, the patients that have the most mTOR dysregulation would have the most S6 kinase phosphorylation and should also be the best responders to rapamycin. So actually, in some ways, it's a validation of the approach we've taken because the way to affect S6 phosphorylation is actually to use rapamycin.